Yeah. Okay, so we're online, so welcome to ARC for another week. And as promised last week, we will continue into Galatians 5. We'll do maybe half of Galatians 5 tonight, something like that. But before we go to the Word, let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you that you organised the order of your kingdom to be a body of many parts, each part playing its own part for the good of the whole body. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would write your law in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, that you would bring to mind everything that we need to know from your word. Lord, lead us and lead the questions, lead the sharing, Lord, lead our understanding so that we have the truth, for without the truth, Lord, there's nothing that matters. There is nothing, Lord, apart from the truth that will survive the judgment, that will survive the testing of all things. We won't want to invest what time we have left, Lord, in things that will not last. So we pray and ask for your help. We pray for those who are still overseas or engaged in the things they need to be engaged in. They can't be here, Lord, and those watching from overseas. We pray for the whole body of Christ who are in the face of the earth, especially, Lord, for those who have no place to fellowship, an increasing problem, Lord. You are the good shepherd who goes and brings back the scattered, you gather them to you. You put the lonely in families. You take up the cause of the oppressed. You are the shepherd of Ezekiel 34, Lord, to bring them back, to lead them out, set free, healed and anointed, to follow you with shouts of rejoicing and joy, Lord. We pray for it, Lord. But we trust that you, being that shepherd, you will also do it in your own zeal. Because of who you are, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, building from last week, we're going to start to look, by the end of our time tonight, we're going to start to look at Galatians 5. But we just have a little introduction part that we need to look at first about grace a topic we've done lots of times but you can never study it enough really just to help us understand the role of grace and God's plan so last week we looked at the scriptures that showed us that God is not dependent on us and thank God for that, because as we know, the state of the church globally is so bad that what hope would you have in many places now, what hope would you have if you're a young person of hearing the gospel according to the scripture when the church is so unfaithful it doesn't even know itself what that is? And you remember from Jeremiah 31, it's core to the new covenant that God will no longer visit the sins of previous generations on their children. So it's contrary to God's covenant and it's contrary to his nature to abandon a new generation to the sins of the generation before. So that's a big theme in the last days. Jesus coming to gather up the last of who can be saved, himself, himself. So we looked at that last week and we saw from the scriptures that God has no trouble saving people all by himself. And actually, I think I could probably say that nobody, I think I was in the church for a decade before anyone ever actually gave me the gospel in the church. Uh, that's, I found that pretty shocking. <laughs> so I know this to be true for myself, that God came and got me himself, that Jesus explained himself to me, showed himself to me, and left me with such a strong faith that no one could ever talk me out of being <coughs> Christian. No, no event could ever shake me from knowing that he is, and he is himself. And sadly, he's nothing like the church increasingly is. So we need to understand a little bit more about God's role 
in our narrow way walk. So we're going to do that tonight. So the first thing I want to look at is Romans 11. So Romans 11, Paul, as we mentioned last week, remember Paul is in many ways the most Jewish of all the apostles. Anyone hazard a guess why he emphasizes Jewish things more than anybody else? Because he's a rabbi. That's right. The rest are fishermen, tax collectors, doctors. But Paul, remember Paul is his new name for the new creation, right? He's really Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, star student of Rabbi Gamaliel. Right? So he's the Pharisee of Pharisees, the rabbi of rabbis. So as we mentioned last week, he expected that God would send him as a rabbi to the Jewish people. And what did God do? The opposite. He sent Paul to the Gentiles, to the Goyen, the nations. Can anyone remember from last week, why did God do that? What can a rabbi do for Gentiles that he doesn't need to do for Jews? When you're building a house, where do you start? Foundations. So if you're if you're a Jewish kid, have you have you any foundation to hear the gospel? You bet, because you've been to synagogue day and night since you were born. You know the Old Testament inside out. You just don't know what it means, but you know it. The foundations are there. The Gentiles didn't have that at all. The Holy Spirit was falling on people, you see in Acts, the Holy Spirit was falling on people and convicting them to be Christian, but they had no foundation at all. They, they didn't know anything about Moses or the law of Moses. They didn't know, you know, anything about the God of the Jews at all. And yet God was giving them his spirit and convicting them to repent and put their hope and their faith in Yeshua. But that will make a pretty weak Christian, right? Especially when you're tested, if, you're, if you don't have solid foundation to stand on. So of course, God first saved and then sent the most skilled rabbi in the land to the people that needed the foundation put down so they could better understand what was happening to them. So that they could better understand the Jewishness of the gospel. And remember, we looked last week, the fact that God included the Gentiles was nothing new. We saw from Isaiah uh, that this was always God's plan. Remember what God said concerning Messiah? He says, it's too small a thing for you to be salvation only to Israel and to Judah. Therefore, I'm going to make you salvation even to the ends of the earth to all nations a light to the Gentiles. Okay, so what was happening might have seemed strange, well not might have seemed strange, it seemed extraordinarily strange to the Jewish people, why are all these Gentiles coming to synagogue or asking to? But if they knew their own book, what God had already said, they would not have been surprised. Everything was happening, just as the prophet said they must. Romans 11 comes out of Paul's never-ending desire to see his own people saved. So he's laboring day and night for you and me, but his concern for his own people, the Jewish people, never goes away. So in Romans 11, he's explaining to the Gentile believers how are they included. It's probably not a very fair question, but how many covenants has God sworn with the Gentile people? I'll give you a clue. You don't need many fingers to count it. Shall I make the clue better? You don't need any fingers to count it because the answer is zero. 
all the covenants, it says in the scripture, all the covenants belong to the Jews. All. So how can we claim the promises of God, the covenant promises of God, as outsiders, as Gentiles? Romans 11 is where Paul explains to Gentiles what God has done. He says that you are wild branches grafted in. So you know how you graft a branch into a tree? Right? So you cut that branch off where it was growing and you make a like a notch in the tree where it's going to grow and you push the branch in and you bind it in there and in the end they, they grow together so that foreign branch will get all its nutrition from the root of that tree. What's the root of the Jewish tree? It's the whole word of God, right? It's Jesus. Remember that Messiah will grow up from the stump of Jesse. He will be a branch that grows up. So when we talk about him as the true vine, or as the tree, it has the tree, the Jewish tree, has natural branches, Jewish believers, and grafted in branches, Gentile believers but we're all part of the one tree. That's why elsewhere it says that the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile is gone. So from God's perspective, how many races are there on earth? Right, race is the wrong word. Can I think of a better word? So we drew it before, there was a sharp distinction between the Jews, the people of the book, the people of the law, and the Goyim, <coughs> the nations, the 70 nations, right? A sharp distinction. But when God looks now, what does he see? How many divisions are there? Because remember, he's taken away that dividing wall, but there's still a division. How many divisions are there now? Only two. <laughs> Believers and unbelievers. Those who are in the covenant and saved, and those who are in the covenant and saved, it no longer matters a job what you were when you were born. Remember, it doesn't matter what you were. This is true also of your own personal walk in salvation. It doesn't matter what you were. The guy that wrote Amazing Grace, right? The master of a slave ship on which hundreds of African slaves died. Did that preclude God from saving him and making him a new creation? No. And giving him that most amazing song? No. Didn't matter what he was. It mattered who he will be. So when we talk about being a new creation, remember from the moment you entered the covenant for real, you were already not who you were, but you are not yet who you will be. You were justified, you're being sanctified, and you will be redeemed. And in the kingdom, you'll be perfect, perfectly new. Okay. So don't worry about your past. The only way your past will ever be a problem to you is if you circle back and revisit it. You know? We used to, have, when we were counselling people, we used to have a, uh, a poster that would say, go and put this on your wall, and it was a, like a big lake called your past, and a big sign sticking up, and it said, no fishing. <laughs> no. no fishing. Past. You died, and you were raised again. You're already a new creation, but you're not yet finished. So, Paul is urgent to explain all this, and he, here, the passage we're going to look at, he wants to explain to them, what about the Jews then that didn't believe? Has God abandoned them? If you listen to sermons on this, modern sermons, you'll hear something called replacement theology, right? It's a terrible heresy. But it's the notion that God abandoned the Jewish people and gave salvation instead to Gentiles. Absolute garbage. Okay, and this is one of the scriptures that re totally refutes it. 
So it was a fair question to Paul. Well, how come most of the church are uh, Gentile? Has God given up on the Jewish people? So let's see what Paul answers. Romans 11, verse 11. He says, Ask then, did God reject his people? By his people he means the Jewish people. By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Keep that in mind, whom he foreknew. Don't you know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. That's from Kings 19. And, and what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works, and if it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Did the people of Israel, uh, what the people of Israel so earnestly sought, they did not obtain, yet the elect among them did obtain it. But the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, Stupors like feeling really sleepy, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear to this very day. What's Paul saying? He's saying, yes, most of the Jewish nation abandoned God, preferred... Do you remember what Baal means? A lot of people think it's a god. It's actually not. The word doesn't mean that. Does anyone know what it means? Husband. Husband. Right? So, God declared to Israel, I have betrothed you to myself. So remember from a Hebrew wedding perspective, betrothal, the bride must behave as if they're married, even though they're not yet married. Right? So, bending the knee to another husband... <coughs> is like spiritual adultery. You know, God is your husband. Oh, you know, but this other God over here is quite good looking. <laughs> it's adultery from God's point. So those who would not bend the knee, would not betray him, come what may, he has set them apart, a remnant chosen by grace. So this bit of passage this idea that you're chosen by grace gets very kinky and out of balance when you get to like hardcore Calvinists and things as we've studied before. So tonight we're not going to worry too much about what's wrong, what wrong teaching about it. We want to really focus on what Paul actually saying. So you see I put that red arrow there? You, this is a letter. The letter is about a subject. Everything in this passage is about one subject. He says about one thing by several different means. We have to understand that to realise he's talking about those he foreknew and a remnant saved by grace are the same people. So those he foreknew is a description of them. And a remnant saved by grace is a description of the same people. Why were they chosen? I just told you the answer. Why were they chosen? See what it says there? A remnant chosen by grace. <clears throat> Why were they chosen? This is a big question that's perplexed Christians for centuries. Why did God choose this person and not that person? Because if you're a hardcore Calvinist, which thank God we're not, you'll just say, well, that's just God's choice, right? You could just roll the dice or spin the wheel or something and have a bit of a lottery, and if your name comes up, you get saved, and if it doesn't, you're not saved, right? That's what Calvinists believe. That's why they don't even evangelize people, because they don't think there's any point, you know? What does it say back 
in verse 11. And bold. Those he what? For you. What does that mean? Remember the two types of time? What time do we experience? Chronos, right? That's why the real name for a watch is a chronometer. Right? And what's the special thing about chronos time? Apologies if you weren't here a couple of years ago when we did this. Linear. Is it linear? It's linear. So it can never go backwards. It always goes straight forward in a time. Like a second hand. So every time the second hand goes tick, that second's gone. Then tick, then that second's gone. It's linear, time going forward. Right? So we only experience time passing as one event after another, one experience after another. Right? What's the other time called? Kairos. Okay. Now, some of us have experienced Kairos time. Kairos is the time God knows. Kairos time is time as God sees it. Right? Now, you can experience Kairos time by going to the hospital as a patient. Has anyone had surgery that required general anaesthetic? Mm -hmm. So, you'll know then, I'll give you a reason why that's the example. There's many examples, but that's what always pops in my head. Because I have to have surgery, right? So, I can remember praying, and my eyes went heavy, 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 and I'm still praying. And then my eyes got lighter again, and I opened my eyes, and I'm still praying. The same prayer. But it was eight hours later. For me, it was the next second. So for Kronos, for me, it was the next second. But for an observer, it was eight hours later. So because humanity just experiences time going by a second at a time, we, we think that is, that's it. But our experience of time isn't the same as for someone observing from outside of the bubble that we're in. Really trying not to dive into my science degree here because it's very difficult to, to do with relativity and things like that. But anyway, so from God's point of view, he makes it clear in the scripture that he has already seen the beginning from the end. What's a title for Messiah? He's the Aleph and the Tan, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Right? What can we say about the relationship of Jesus with Judas, Iscariot, Yehuda? When he betrays the Lord, who knows about the betrayal first? Yeah, when does he know about it? It's really important. When does he know about it? Before they even met. Right? He's deliberately included. The scripture is explicit. That Jesus knew that he would betray him from the beginning. Why? Because he's already seen it. <coughs> For knowledge. <coughs> so it's not some clever trick. It's from God's perspective. He's already seen the whole of human history. What's another really basic thing from the Old Testament, a concept from the Old Testament, that would, there's a, in fact, it's a whole section of your Bible that would tell you that God must have seen it already. The Hebrew word is Navi. Thank you, Nicholas. Sorry? That's an example of it. This is fundamental <coughs> to faith. What does the Old Testament consist of mainly? You have the books of the law, you have the history, the chronicles, and then the big chunk is 
I'll give you an example. Isaiah. What is he? Prophet. What is Isaiah doing? Is he fortune telling? Is he predicting the future? What's he doing? He's echoing what he's told. And when God tells him, what is God telling him? This might happen. So long as this happens and this happens, and then this happens, then this will happen. Does that sound like prophecy? No. What does God say? A time will come when this exact thing will take place. <coughs> Boom. How can God know that? Why? He's already seen it. Because remember, some people will say oh, God's just forcing that to happen, right? Everywhere in the Gospel we know, everywhere even in the Old Testament, free will, our nemesis, our weak point, our weak link, free will, has to be free. So how could God say with such clarity exactly what's going to happen? It's because he's already seen it. So this remnant that God chooses by grace is because he has foreknown that they will not betray him. Another example is um, Peter. Peter says, not me, Lord, I won't run, I'll even be crucified with you. What happens? What does Jesus say? The cock will crow three times, you know, and all that. Night. What happens to Peter? He's beside himself, right? He can't believe that he's betrayed his Lord, but then he remembers what Jesus said. You're going to do this, but you're also going to recover. And when you've recovered, you're going to lead my people. God has foreseen the whole of human history already. He doesn't arbitrarily save some people and not others. The gospel, as we've studied it before, the covenant is open to anyone who will come. Remember the parable of the wedding? The original invitees were too busy, so what was the instruction of the servant? Go out and find anyone who's willing to come, right? The, it's an open invitation. But God already knows who for sure will just flatly refuse, whose hearts are too hard. And he knows those who will come but only stay for a while you know, the parable of the seed, you know, so they'll, where it falls on shallow soil, so they'll stay for a while, but as soon as it gets tough, no surprises for God, right? But he knows. A remnant, he has foreknown, will not just come, they'll stay, they'll persevere to the end. That's what Paul is saying. The Jewish people have not gone. There's always been Messianic Jews from the beginning. There's always been a Jewish Christian group. Not large, but God has preserved them throughout the centuries. They've always been there. Always. So, let's go back to our scripture. So he says, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. So we understand what that means now. It simply means that he has graciously set aside those he's already seen will be his. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works, and if it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly they did not obtain. Then it says, the elect among them did. We need to understand what elect means. So under that box you'll see there the description of grace. The word is charis in Greek. And you, normally the, the simple translation is a gift. Right? So like the gifts of the spirit are the charisma gifts. The word itself though is means to lean favorably towards to incline yourself with good intention towards someone as a deliberate thing. And it's the Greek word trying to explain an even older Hebrew word, ken. And ken means 
to yearn. What do I mean by to yearn? <coughs> it's is that strong enough? But you're right. But is, is yearn stronger than desire? In the Hebrew, it is. It means desire, but it's not just like I desire an ice cream or I desire. It's something much more intense. You know? So if you were ever the acne covered boy in class and the best looking girl in the school shifted to your class, you might yearn to sit next to her as opposed to desire, right? Most 10 year old boys will, well, 15 year old boys will understand that, right? It, that's what this word means. It's an intense, almost like a need. There's no, it doesn't even seem rational sometimes. But it's like this intense desire that has to be fulfilled. Like I have to have this or I'll die. Kind of, that kind of yearning. So that's what the original Hebrew word means. And charis in Greek was the nearest word to the Hebrew word. So it's not just a gift from God. It's a leaning, God leaning down towards someone with this intensity of desire. For what? To have them. To recover them. To save them. To own them in the, in the good kind of way. You know? To betroth himself with a view to permanent marriage. That's what Grace is trying to say. Unfortunately, in English, it's just too weak. You know, all of that gets lost in English. It feels usually say, "Oh, it just means a gift," and people say, "Oh, salvation is just a gift of God." And people get like a mental picture of like, "Well, you know, God's rich. What's it costing him?" You're right. So, you want, would you like Alan? Would you like salvation here? Would you like some as well? You just like picture God, like you know, the sack sack full of salvation going, would you like some? some but people picture it that lightly. But the language is very specific, not by any means. And you think about Jesus going to the cross, you know, sweating blood in the garden. It's, he has to have his bride. He cannot not have her. And if he has to go to the cross, if he has to suffer, suffer that indignation, if he has to take her sin upon himself to have her, to give her what he wants her to have, because she can't get it for herself. The sinful nature cannot enter the kingdom. The sinful nature cannot solve itself. All have sinned, all have fallen short. So the only way he can rescue his bride is if he gives her what she can't give herself. And if the only way he can do that is through the cross, and all of that, <coughs> it's important that this word means to lean towards, to come down towards. So it's not us trying to rise to God, it's God inclining himself prostrating himself, if you like, in, from heaven into our world. Such is the intensity of his yearning to save us. So if you know Jesus even a tiny bit, never ever doubt the intensity of his desire to save you. Satan's very good at seeding the idea that God is largely indifferent to your suffering and that he's, you know, if you don't work hard enough, he won't really care if you're not there. Nothing could be further from the truth. Okay? Nothing could be further from the truth. So we under, have to understand another aspect of this. In both languages, the words 
Ken in Hebrew and Karis in Greek come with the understanding that they're, they're a verb, right? It's an action. That the action is 100% about the giver. 100% about the giver. So the giver is yearns to give it whether the person receiving it wants to receive it or not. Okay? It means that grace does not depend on you. God's desire to save you is independent of your response. Your salvation is not independent of your response, but his desire to save you is not affected by the fact that you're a sinner. There's nothing he can discover about you on the way that would change his mind because how many things about you does God not already know? None. Nothing is hidden from him. As it says about Jesus, Jesus didn't need anyone to explain about a person because he knew what was in every man. So God goes into this eyes wide open and fully informed about you and all your faults. Not just the faults you've already fallen in, but the ones you're going to fall in tomorrow. Why? Because he has foreknown your whole life. So that's very important to understand how a bigger deal grace is in salvation. Because as I said, the enemy will always try and convince you that you've messed up too much, that God won't want you anymore, and blah, 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 blah. No. From, the, from before you knew he existed, he already knew everything about you that, till your last day on earth. And yet, he leaned and climbed toward you to save you, even though it meant he had to go through the cross to get you. Never doubt that. And we can see that in our next scripture on, there on page 1, Romans 5. You should all know this, I guess. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this way. While we were all sinners, Christ... Sorry, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't wait till you were perfect before saving you. While you are at your worst. Think about that slave captain again. The one that wrote Amazing Grace, right? Did Jesus wait till he reformed? Did he wait till he'd sorted himself out and says, oh, well, you've done very well. Would you like to be saved? No, right? Very important for us that no matter how bumpy your walk, even a bit of backsliding, which is actually pretty normal for most people, at some stage in your life. You know, something happens, you get abused by some dopey church person or whatever. God has already seen that that's going to happen to you and he's already <coughs> got it in hand. He knew all of it when he called you. He didn't wait for you to be perfect before he made the offer. You know? The reason why I'm emphasising these things that are probably should be pretty basic is because of the times we live in and the way the enemy will try and attack and scatter the flock with doubt, especially doubt about God's love for you. So even if this is about Sunday school, which I guess it is, it's important to be reminded in the days that we live in to put that foundation, make sure that's glued in underneath you. Then it says, further down the page, we see in verse 5 and again in verse 7, we have this word for that's translated as election. And the actual word is eklog, ekloge rather. So chosen by grace and election are actually, in the original language, the same word. So in one place they translate it chosen by grace. The other place they call it the elect. But actually in the original language it's just one word. So the translators have used two different ways of saying the same thing. 
but in the original script it's just one word, so we better know what that word means. So it's a two-part word. Ek, E-K, means to separate something out from a bigger group. Loge, what does Loge sound like? Another word that you know. Jesus is the word made flesh. He is the, the Logos. Logos is to do with speech. Right? The word. This word Logo means to, to speak to a specific purpose. You put these two concepts together, ek logo, means to separate by words something out of a bigger group. That's what elect means. It's not a raffle. You know the Calvinist idea that God just elects, like rolls a dice or something, to choose some people and not others? The word itself, the original word, means he speaks in order to separate. That's what the gospel does. You can speak to a thousand people in a huge auditorium with just one message. The gospel. Does everyone get saved? No. Some people respond and others harden their hearts against it. Now you've got two groups. Those that believe become separated by those words. Because they believe the words, they become separated from the larger group that they began with. That's what this word means. So chosen by grace because they're foreknown, they become the elect, the word of God, causes them to be separated out from humanity, set aside. Right? What does Jesus command us to do something because it reflects God's nature starts with H? Be holy, right? Kodesh, right? Kodesh. What does it mean? Separate. To be separate. The elect. It's one concept. So this is the Greek words trying to say something in Hebrew. That by the hearing of the word of God, this remnant will become holy. Kodesh. Set apart from the rest. It's separated out from the rest. And the hearing the word of God what happens, what comes by the hearing of the word of God? Faith. Faith. So we can say that the inquiry of faith by hearing of the word of God, which means it has to be the word of God, right? Not some wacky prosperity gospel or some other garbage. But by hearing the actual gospel, faith results in a remnant that God has foreknown and it causes them to be separated out from the great mass and ever after he calls them holy, set apart to God. Does that make sense? We all critically does not trample on free will. God already knows who the remnant will be. You and I don't, so who should we evangelize? Everybody. Because we don't have the foreknowledge. It's not for us to know. We don't know who will come and stay for a while and then go cold. Can remember once saved, always saved? Scripturally is a nonsense. We know that before Messiah comes, what has to happen? has to be a great falling away. The love of most will go cold. Well, something can't go cold unless it was first hot. Right? So but none of that will surprise God. Just like Judas. God already knows who's going to walk the distance. 
why wouldn't he do this? Why doesn't he just, why doesn't he just foreknowing us, why doesn't he just snatch us out of humanity in one blast and take us straight to heaven? He gave us free choice. He gave us free choice, that's very important. So why, why do you and I have to endure our 70 years or 80 years or whatever it will be in amongst all this apostasy and every other crazy stuff going on in the world? Why does God make us plod our way through the mess to get home when he already knows that we're not going to betray him? I'm only asking it because someone might ask you, I'll give you a clue. Is it beneficial to us? Yes. yes. Why? It's to do with free choice, by the way. I think it's a test of faithfulness. It's a test of faithfulness. And obedience. And obedience. But God foreknows. So in a sense, it's a test that he already knows the results for. Right? He foreknows. But you're onto something. Who needs to know the outcome of the testing? When I'm tested, who needs to know the result? Me. Why? Because if I fail, what should I do? I should snap out of my slumber and realize that I have wandered somehow, that I couldn't deal with them as a Christian. I need to scramble my way back up onto the rock I need to scramble my way back onto the narrow way. I need to do whatever I need to do. Because who am I? I'm the bride who's supposed to make herself ready for the wedding while the groom is away, preparing a place for them. That's the Hebrew wedding, remember? All the bumps and the knocks and the, you know, falling over the cliff periodically is designed to wreck old you and make new you so that by the time it's time for the, those who are going to be the bride because they, they have chosen not to turn back they are nowhere even remotely like they were when they first became betrothed and what has changed them? All of that. Because every time you're in a pothole, the only ladder you have to climb out is the scripture. Turning to the word of God, appealing to him on the basis of who he really is and so on, right? The more we are tested, the more we respond as the bride who wants to be married to him. The more we are changed, the more we grow. And then there's a secondary benefit. Are you doing this in isolation? No. Is anyone watching? Yes. So uh, is, your, is your struggle for your benefit only? No. If you're a parent, it's particularly for your children. Remember the 80-20 rule. Your kids will turn out 20% of what you said and 80% of imitating you. It's the reality. So watching you, being very real, dealing with all the struggles of life and, ex and seeing you turn to your faith and digging in to be more faithful, to better understand, to benefit from the trial as God intends benefits your children to see that. So that's a parenting tip. Never pretend to be God as if you don't have any faults. You know? So that's what all election means. Right? Let's go over to page two. So if you had chosen, if God has done this, made himself known to you and inclined himself towards you and given you the Holy Spirit, and what is a 
what is the tendency, especially as we see so much in the modern church, what bad thing can happen if people overcook <laughs> the reality that God loves me and God wants me and I'm a king's kid, etc., etc.? Where can that all go horribly wrong? Sorry? When it goes to your head and it just puffs up your self-image and your pride, right? Usually because they've been told all about the love of God and grace has been overemphasized as a gift, a free gift that you don't have to do anything in response. So it's all about the benefit and no, nothing ever told you about the cost, right? So of course that puffs up the human nature and it can result in horrible, narcissistic, self-centered, arrogant church people. I don't think I can call them Christian. So our next scripture to help us be grounded in our understanding comes from Luke 18 and it's our cover sheet. You want to have a quick look at my hand? Pretty picture there? That's the Pharisee and the tax collector both coming to pray. Let's read it together. Luke 18 verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, those robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over there. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So let's start at the end. What does it mean by exalt? So the word there is hupsu. Hupsu in Greek. And hupsu simply means to be elevated, lifted up. Okay? So scripturally, this is a valid goal. But what is the ultimate expression of hutsu for Christians? What is the ultimate lifting up? It's salvation. You, as by way of example, the rapture. You were just a human being but you're not going to be if you persevere to the end. What are you going to be? Are you going to be human still? What are you going to be? If he... How do we next see Jesus if we're really his disciples? Just generally. If you're really his disciple, even if you die tomorrow, but you are really his disciple, or you're still alive when this happens, and you're really his disciple, how do you, we next see him? The rapture and the, res and the first resurrection, right? So there's a direction involved of travel. Whether, it, whether you are raptured or resurrected, there's a direction of travel. Does Jesus, by the way, does Jesus come all the way back to earth for that? No. Where do we meet him? in the air, okay? So he approaches the earth and summons his bride. So if you're still walking around alive, you're raptured. If you already died, you're resurrected. It's two halves of one event, right? But what direction do you go? Up. Hope so. Okay? As high as the heavens are above the earth. Right? So the ultimate expression of this is valid. It's only valid if you're there at the end. This, this elevation is for those who actually go up. Where it can all go wrong is that Pharisee's attitude. 
What is that Pharisee saying? I am not like other people. Is that true? What can we say about that Pharisee that he doesn't understand? He's a sinner as well. From God's perspective, which which is the worst person? The Pharisee or the tax collector? Neither. Neither deserve heaven. If you break the law in just one place, you're a lawbreaker. Right? Neither. Which of the two men understood that? Only the tax collector. The Pharisee, though he's supposed to be Israel's teacher, is in la-la land. Because he thinks, because he tithes. Think about modern church. I tithe. You know, I fast. I come to church, I sing in the choir. I even lead the Bible study now and again. I'm not like those other people. It's arrogance. Not only is it arrogance, it's blindness to your own actual state. And it's the biggest problem with dominionism, the king, the whole kingdom now thing, imagining that the kingdom is already here in full and that you are already finished. You are not yet who you will be. So it's true, you've been justified but you are not yet who is able to go into the kingdom. You are not ready to go up yet. You'll go up when it's time for you to go up. In the meantime, you are a work in progress. Which guy was praying in the truth? It's the tax collector, right? Which guy had the most faith in God? It's not hard to work out. The Pharisee, who does he have faith in? Himself. himself. So much faith in himself that he can stand before God and say, you have to let me in, you have to bless me. Because look at me, I'm shiny. Not like that guy. It's delusional. Right? There's a huge problem in the modern church. A huge problem. And it's from bad teaching, alas. But it's a huge problem, and it's why so many people have no time for Christianity when they meet Christians, they want to run away. Because they keep meeting these cocky, self-centered, arrogant, I'm better than you people who if you're around them for five minutes, it's immediately obvious that they're not better than you at all. Sometimes they're pretty horrendous. Okay. The Pharisee had a clear view of himself before God. He told the truth. He trusted God for mercy. The other guy wasn't even asking for mercy. You know, I'm an ex-Sally, and this is a huge problem among Sally's, is this idea that, well, I'm saved now, so now I can go out and save everybody else. And I work with so many people, like in alcohol and drug rehab, who had the same problems as the people that were there as patients. But they would never see their own issues because in their heads, they're like, well, we're the Christians, so we're like fault-free. But this poor sinner here, I'll just save them. You know, that's a massive, massive problem. What can we learn from this, though? For what's the takeaway for our own attitude going forward? What sort of attitude should you have for your own benefit? What should you have for the benefit of others that you can learn from this parable? It's not by works, that's, it's not by the works of the ritual, that's true, but the attitude. 
what these two guys have two very separated attitudes. God, Jesus only honors one of them. So which which of the two attitudes do you think you'd want to have then? Humility. Humility. Humility is not the same as humiliation. What is the key thing about this guy's humility? What is it based on? The the proud, the to the humble. That's right. He he opposes the proud and he lifts up the humble. What is humbleness based on? I gave you a clue about the Pharisee's view of himself. What does the Pharisee not have? Deny yourself. No. So the Pharisee is missing something that the tax collector has. Fear of the Lord. Fear of God which is, introduces wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. So associated with wisdom, what what's coming out of the tax collector's mouth about himself? Repentance. Simpler. I'll, I'll just tell you. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. The Pharisee is talking a whole lot of hypothetical la-la that's very unreal. Not even remotely real about his true state. Truth and the love of the truth are at the heart of discipleship. Jesus is the truth. If you don't love the truth, you don't love Jesus. This guy did not hide from God. Remember Adam and Eve? What disappointed God most about Adam and Eve? They made clothes, remember? That's the Pharisee. So in your prayer time and in your dealing with God, don't be Adam and Eve. Don't be the Pharisee. You have to come like naked as you are before him because guess what? That's how he sees you. Mm -hmm. Nothing is hidden from him. You can't get anywhere with God playing word games or trying to impress him with long speeches or making excuses or blaming someone else. You have to be that tax guy. In the full light and knowledge of what grace means, while you are still at your worst, worse than you are now, he came looking for you. He inclined himself toward you. With zeal, yearning, remember? Yearning. Very, very important. So, in the next little section there, I talked a bit about this terrible snare you can fall into Dominionism, Calvinism, and a bunch of other isms we won't worry about too much. But they're to do with the worldview that the kingdom is already here because you'll see I've given you some scriptures you can look up later. So if you're watching from overseas, you can write down 2 Timothy 2 verse 12, Revelation 20 verse 6. And there are others, but those two will do. So what you'll find there is there is a promise that we will reign with him. So a time is coming where we will reign with him. Can anyone think weddings? Can anyone think when would the girl reign with her husband? Let's just say you're marrying Prince, and we don't like Prince Harry anymore, do we, apparently? Um, and William's taken. Let's imagine William's not taken, and you're the girl, right? And William's going to be the king, right? So if you want to reign with William, there's a, some small thing has to happen first. What's that? Marriage. The only one who can reign with him is his wife. So she co-reigns as the queen. He has all the actual power and authorities that head, up, head over her. But she has a certain amount of authority as the queen, right? Even though he's the king and ultimately he's in charge. So if we're the bride of Christ, when will we reign with the king? When? Only 
when a marriage has taken place. Mm -hmm. Remember, we are only betrothed at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Until the wedding supper of the Lamb, until those who become the bride, then and only then will we assume that co-governance of creation, that authority that comes from being the wife, the queen. That's the problem of dominionism, kingdom now, all that stuff, is you've got all these people whose pride is puffed up, running around, behaving as if they were already co-reigning. That's why you get people commanding this in Jesus' name and that in Jesus' name, and as, if, as if whatever they thought of has the authority of Jesus, as if they were already the bride. No, they're not. No one is yet. Does that make sense? We have to understand that it is a real thing and it will happen, but timing is important. It, it's inevitable, but not yet. Once we're the bride, it's true. At the moment, we're just betrothed. So when he gives us his spirit, because the gift, of course, of grace is the spirit, right? What so instead of being puffed up and full of pride and running around behaving as if we were the bride already or the queen already, let's see what's supposed to happen. John 16. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Remember the text like that? Truth, truth, truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belong to the Father is mine. That is why I say the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus elsewhere explains that the Father will empower him to do what? To fulfill the law and the testimony. That's what the Spirit actually gives Christians. The prophecy of scripture, the understanding of the times based on the scripture, the understanding of what to do in situations. He gives you the mind of Christ to understand from the scripture that Jesus is fulfilling. How to reflect him here on earth as his future bride. The Holy Spirit does not give you Harry Potter power to run around to, inf to enact your will in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will not give you a different gospel. The Holy Spirit will never contradict the scripture because Jesus is the scripture in person. Remember, he is the Var Adonai, the word made flesh. So the word in print is the, is the scripture and the word in the flesh is Jesus, if you don't love the first, you will not love the second. Because they are one and the same. And the Spirit will not testify for a Jesus that contradicts the Word, because he is the Word. So if you really have the Spirit, you'll be mad on the Word. You'll want the truth. The truth. Also, John 16, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away, the helper, the paracletes, the, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will do three things. He'll convict the world concerning sin, <coughs> righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. For new Christians, that's quite difficult to understand. So, the tax collector in Luke 18 is clearly under the conviction of the Spirit. He is the fear of God. He is under the conviction of sin, his own sin. He's under conviction of the righteousness of God. And because I'm a sinner and God is righteous, he understands the concept of judgment. 
that there will be consequences. And that means he doesn't take his sin lightly. He comes to God to deal with it. He doesn't assume. He doesn't diminish or belittle it as if it didn't matter. When you really have the Holy Spirit, unfortunately, you will be uncomfortable. Because the Holy Spirit is always trying to make you holy. He's always trying to sanctify you. He's always trying to conform you to the Word. So he doesn't let you settle comfortably into, oh, this is good enough. You know, I've been sanctified enough. This will do, won't it? Just a few bad habits or a few terrible sins that I keep committing, surely the blood of Jesus will just take care of that. You can get into that attitude, but the Holy Spirit won't stand for that. If you're really born again, the Holy Spirit will trouble you until you deal with it. For your sake. Because he's trying to get the bride ready, dressed for the wedding. Right? So that's why Christians often have so much so many tears, <laughs> so much discomfort. Because for your sake, the Holy Spirit will not let you slack off. If God foreknows that you are really going to be the bride, he will trouble you about the things you are avoiding that he needs you to deal with. And if you're a bad student, well, he's pretty good at dealing with bad students. He knows how to stand you on your end until you listen. Okay? It's better to cooperate, trust me. It's over faster. Let's shoot over to page three. So with all that in mind, we're going to start on Galatians 5. But we're only going to do like about half of it. So let's read the whole of Galatians 5. Let's all read it out aloud together and then we'll, we'll go to explain maybe the first half. So it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. For you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. In case you're wondering, that's agape. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then a stumbling block, sorry, the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the spirit of God, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. You may not do the things that you please. If you are led by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. 
for which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Holy Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging to one another, or envying one another. That's pretty intense, right? I wish the modern church would pay more attention to that. It might get a terrible big fright. Anyway, let's we have time to look at maybe half. So let's look at the first one. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore keep standing and do not again be subject to the yoke of slavery. So one of the things that goes wrong, and I've listened to whole sermons on this that are just nonsense. They'll say, Jesus set you free. We are free in Christ. But they don't read this in context. And they will convince their congregations that you are not, that the law basically doesn't exist anymore. That you are so free from the law that you can get away with being lawless. What is the special danger of being suckered into thinking that you can be a lawless Christian at a time like we live in? No one can be certain, but all the signs are there that we could, easy, we could see the return of Jesus in our lifetime, the way things are going, right? So just for the sake of argument, let's say that somehow we know for sure that that's happening. So before Jesus comes back, something else has to happen, something much less desirable, but nevertheless unavoidable. Something has to happen first. Who has to come first? Antichrist, right? Vicarius Christos. He has a special name in Second Thessalonians. Paul calls him something. He gives him a title. The man of lawlessness. Right? Lawlessness, no law. A nomai in the Greek, no law. Right? <coughs> when churches preach this freedom, that grace cancels the law and lots of churches preach that. It leaves people wide open to be seduced by lawlessness in the belief that God doesn't mind. In the belief that grace is a blank check for sin. That the blood of Jesus will just pay it. It is not what the scripture says at all. Not by any stretch of the imagination. What is this freedom then that he's talking about? You were, it was for freedom that Christ came. If you've received the grace of God, it's to give you freedom. Yes, absolutely true. It's not freedom from the law that you can be lawless and still go to heaven. What is it then? Without grace, without the Holy Spirit, your free will is not free. Sin, the sinful nature, has both hands on your steering wheel and will drive you. Unregenerate people are slaves to the sinful nature. They cannot be but sinful. The freedom he's talking about is the ability to be free from being controlled by the old nature. You get a freed world. A world that actually has a degree of freedom that you can make choice to do the right thing instead of just being dragged along by the old nature. That's what the freedom he's talking about. So when he says here, Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Right? Don't be enslaved over again. 
don't allow what you have to be lost by making a mistake. Let's go on to the next part. If you receive circumcision, Christ will have no benefit from you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the entire law. You being severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For in Christ, neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So the common mistake that happens, people trying to read this or explain it, or lots of sermons I've listened to, which is just off the wall. You have to remember what we said at the beginning, this is a letter. Right, Galatians, it's, this is, remember we did last week who the Galatians were? Total pagan, non-Jewish Celts living in what's now Anatolia, Turkey, right? Couldn't get less Jewish if you tried. So he's writing to them. And they'd received the Holy Spirit, and now remember, this is just hailing back to last week, Remember, there's that group of confused Jewish believers who are trapped between the two covenants. They want to please God, but their whole life they've been coming to temple to give the sacrifices, all the ritual law, right? Including being circumcised on the seventh day, right? So for them, culturally, those are rituals. It's just the ritual stuff. Sacrificing the lamb at Passover and so on. That's so ingrained in them that even though they've received the Spirit and even though they believe in Jesus, their old nature, which trusted in the rituals. Let's, I can know if you remember, what happens at Yom Kippur? What's the English version of Yom Kippur? Day of Atonement, right? So, that points to the second coming. So what happens when the scapegoat is curled? So when they bring the scapegoat out, what does the high priest do? He lays his hands and he ritually imparts the sins of the whole nation on the goat. And then the goat is driven out of the city and the goat dies instead of them. But if you were living as a Jew in those times, when the goat's gone out and the goat's dead, how will you feel after that? If you really shall we say, orthodox Jewish in those days, you'll actually feel relieved. <clears throat> because even though it's only a ritual, remember that the blood of the animals could only cover over the sin, it couldn't take it away. But you'll feel that something actually happened, that you were actually put right with God again for another year. Because that's the basis of it. It only lasts for a year, and then you have to do it again next year. right? <clears throat> so these... Jewish people who become Christian by the grace of God, that's so ingrained in them. It was quite hard for them to let that go. They wanted to please God, and it was so ingrained in them. They thought, well, all these Gentiles getting the Holy Spirit, they don't know the law. They don't know that you need to be circumcised. They don't know that you, you know... But remember what we spoke last week? Paul, for 15 years, Paul's been evangelizing amongst the Gentiles and seeing God really transform them and really and not a ritual in sight. God had abandoned the rituals. Why? Let's pick an obvious one. Why would you not sacrifice a goat at Yom Kippur again? It's just a ritual, right? Why would you not do that? Why would that make God angry instead of pleased? Jesus. How many times does Jesus need to die? Once. It says once for all, right? Some people think that means once for all people. It doesn't mean that. Once means one death for all the deaths required in the law. So the Passover lamb and the scapegoat and, 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 and. So anything that needed to die in the law, his one death satisfies every requirement for a death or for the shedding of blood in the whole law, right? So if you think you have to kill another goat, what are you saying about his sacrifice? Not sufficient. 
you are belittling the blood of Christ, treating it as if it wasn't enough and that somehow this manky, stinky goat is going to make the difference. This is what Paul was trying to get them to understand. Until Messiah came, these, all these symbols, all these rituals are just like a teaching tool telling them what Messiah would be and what he would do when he came. But now that he had come, now you have the real thing. You don't need the preview anymore. So the law remains. Nothing is gone from the law. Remember Jesus says heaven and earth will disappear before even one punctuation mark will disappear from the law until all of it is fulfilled. Is all of the law fulfilled? No. Because we mentioned Yom Kippur, right? All of those things relate to the second coming. So he's partially fulfilled Yom Kippur by dying as the scapegoat. But everything else that happens at Yom Kippur is awaiting its fulfillment, which happens at the second coming. So you have to have trumpets, Yom Teruah, trumpets. You have to be, have the days of awe. Yamim, not Im. You have to have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Then after that, you have to have Sukkot, living for your seven days in the booth, followed by Hanukkah, celebrating the return of the light to the temple, which is the return of Christ to the new temple in Jerusalem. Okay? All of that is a future event in Kronos time for us. So the law is as good as fulfilled. Now that Jesus has come, there is no question that it will be. It's as good as fulfilled, but it's not in Kronos time, like as we experience time. It's not yet fulfilled. Therefore, the whole of the law remains. He's only talking about the ritual. So it says, why are you relying on these rituals which have no value for salvation? They are only instructive so that you would recognize Christ for who he is. When you have the real thing, why are you going back again to things that were only a, an instructive demonstration? And that's why he says that if you, in this letter, is specific about the circumcision group who were trying to get Gentiles to be physically circumcised. Can anyone remember... What does circumcision stand for? Why, why was it introduced? So it's an outward sign that you had entered into the covenant. Gentiles, I don't know if you know this, but Gentiles could always enter into the covenant. So it was in the law, it was in the law of Moses that a Gentile could become a Jew, but if they were male, they had to be circumcised as a sign that they'd entered into the covenant. Right? What Paul's saying is everything that Jesus taught is about being a God, God's person inwardly, not just mere outward appearance. The huge distinction Jesus makes in all this preaching is between the true inner state of someone and how they appear. Remember he talks about the Pharisees, says you're like whitewashed terms, you're white and shiny on the outside, very impressive, but inside you're just dead man's bones. I could go on for hours on. So this, much of the gospel is about God no longer tolerating mere appearances. And circumcision is like that. And medically, certainly when I was born in the 60s, most males were circumcised for medical reasons because it was considered more hygienic. So if being circumcised is a ticket to heaven, then anyone my age walking around is probably going to heaven because just about every Kiwi guy is really unusual to not be circumcised and nothing to do with faith. That's a case in point that outward appearances mean nothing if what's, who's at home inside is not that born-again, spiritful person. So, 
that's what he means by if you let yourself be forced to be circumcised, you've cut yourself off from Christ and are again relying on mere appearances. And if you want to rely on the ritual, then you are back under the law, in which case you need to keep the whole law. And no one can, of course. If you're ever having this argument with anyone, how can you, and how can you immediately remind them that no one, no one, has any prayer <coughs> of keeping the law? And I'll, get, I'll give you a clue, it's to do with a hill in Jerusalem. How, how can you demonstrate to them that any attempt to be justified by the ritual law is doomed to instant failure? There's no temple. There's no temple. And what does the law require? Well, a huge chunk of it must be carried out in the temple, on Temple Mount, in Jerusalem by the Levites. Where are the Levites now? No one knows. No Israeli knows their tribe. Right? No one can be sure what tribe they belong to. And only Levites can serve in the temple. Right? So you've got no temple. You've got no one who can be certain that they're actually a Levite. So God made sure he got the assistance of seven legions of Roman soldiers to burn the place down and, and destroy it stone by stone so that there's no doubt that God is done with those mere outward appearances and ritual. It's impossible because if you try and be justified by the law, you are committed to keep the whole law. If you break it in even one place, <coughs> you're a lawbreaker. As example by Moses. Remember when he struck the rock and said that he wasn't allowed to enter the promised land as it's as a teaching thing. You know, Moses represents the law, so if he, he only broke the law in one place and God said you can't enter. Okay. Well, let's move on. So as we have done a million times, one Samuel sixteen verse seven. Galatians 2 verse 6, 2 Corinthians verse 10 this is in the second paragraph on page 4. All of those, if you look at those, you see that God makes it crystal clear that he pays no attention to outward appearance. The first one in Samuel is the example I always go to where David the king is being chosen. Remember he's the runt of the family. He's the little skinny guy out with the sheep and all his brothers are big tall warriors. And Samuel, God sends him to anoint the next king, right? And he's looking at their outward appearance and it's like, well, this guy looks like a king. And God's like, no. How about this guy? He's like, look, look at that, you know? Perfect. No. Until this, he runs out of big, strong, good-looking sons, right? And he has to ask, do you have any more sons? <laughs> There's only this little runt out there. Can't be him, surely. And that's when God says what he says. I, the Lord, pay no attention to outward appearance, but I judge the thought and intent of the heart. God is only interested in who's at home, in the tent, not the tent. Appearances may fool one another, but not God. Does that make sense? So this circumcision business, that's what Paul was trying to hammer home to them. Do not be dragged back to trying to be justified before God by all of the energetic outward appearance stuff. We used to have that in the one church, the one core I went to, that if you didn't wear your uniform, as a salary, remember, if you didn't wear your uniform, you were going to hell. <laughs> because real Christians wore the uniform. And in the old days, if you're a woman and you didn't wear your hat in church, you're definitely going to hell. You know, outward appearance, what a joke. A lot of people were hurt by such rubbish. But make no mistake, he is looking at the inner you to see whether you're his or not, whether the law of God is ruling in you, not you just putting on a show to be seen by people, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Let's move on. So halfway down page four, 
For, Christ, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So we already explained why circumcision, and he means here specifically physical circumcision. That's the subject of the letter. Why? So whether you're physically circumcised or not circumcised for a Christian doesn't have any meaning. Zero. None. Because it's just an external thing. What matters is faith working through love. We have to understand what that means. So, look at Romans 2, verse 29. Romans 2, verse 29. A person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. By the written code is just another way of saying physical circumcision. The written code required physical circumcision. So that's all it means. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. What does that mean? It's really important for your motivation, for your behaviour. Such a person's praise, so a real Christian's praise, is from God, not other people. What does that mean? Can you fool the people? It's not very really hard. Can you fool God? No. So the real praise, real reward, real anything, is only real if God approves it. You can put on a great performance and be really popular in the church or whatever, but the judgment of those, the, your popularity with those people, the praise of those people, what will that mean on the day of judgment? Nothing. Because they too are since half blind, right? So what does their opinion mean? Not a lot. So work for the approval of God. Worry about who you really are inside, not how you appear. Because you know what? The more genuinely Christian you are, the less people will approve of you. Because we're in a sinful, fallen world. And as the end gets closer, that will be more and more true. Don't worry about it. What does their opinion mean? Nothing. So, to understand why all this stuff about the... Um, why it being inwardly is so important, you have to remember that the actual covenant, which is you find in Jeremiah 31, God promises to write his law on your heart and in your mind, to put his law inwardly. Whereas under the Mosaic law, whereas the law is on your bookshelf. You know? It was external to you. And it was all about ex what you did externally. You were following these rituals. Under the new covenant, the law has to be within you. What does faith working through love mean? Hmm? So he says here that Circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't mean anything but faith working through love. This is important to avoid falling into the trap of thinking that grace means you're not subject to the law anymore. Not the ritual, I'm not talking about the ritual law anymore, I mean God's moral law. What's faith? Pistis, right? What does it mean? It always means both to believe and to act on that belief. The two are never divorced. As James says, I'll show you faith, but I won't do it. You know, faith without works is dead, meaningless. So it's faith is not just belief. It's always belief and the actions that follow from that belief. That's what pistis, the Greek word, means. Right, or enema in Hebrew has the same meaning. So, faith, so belief in the truth and action based on the belief in the truth, working through 
love, but here it's particularly agapeo. What's the special thing about agape as opposed to eros or filio love? Is it emotion based? No. No. What's the basis of agape love? Obedience. Obedience. To what? To the testimony of the word. Mm -hmm. To be so remember we when we studied it, it's it's a agape is another way, it's a one word for Christ likeness. So the more perfect your agape, the more like him, the more the reflection of him you are. To, so faith, belief, expressing itself in action, and the action is agape, Christ likeness. That is what a circumcised heart produces. So outward circumcision, relying on rituals. Do you think the modern church relies on rituals? So if you go to a high Anglican or Orthodox Catholic or a Lutheran church or something like that, well, it's full of rituals, right? Or a Greek Orthodox or something like that. So we all know that. But how about the Holy Roller Brigade? How about like Hillsong or like or Arise? Are they relying on rituals? I would argue that they are. Because every single Sunday is a clone of the one before. They're very, very ritual oriented. They do the same thing over and over. You sing so many choruses, like robots. <coughs> they do this, they do that, the whole thing. It's easy to stand there and just attend. And lots of people do, just attend. It's no good. The only Christianity that has any value is when the word goes in and changes you from within and results from within in your actions being Christ-like. That you become conformed to him in agreement with him, a reflection of him more and more as you mature in your faith. That's the demonstration, the outward, out, the outward working of the inward state. Does that make sense? It's conscious of the time, so I'm going to speed up a bit. Let's go down to, because we only have a short bit to go. So, bottom of page four, just to remind us of the scripture there from Galatians 5. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? See, obeying the truth. Nothing to do with lawless, doing what you please. He says, who's stopping you from obeying? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you, so that whatever's doing that is not from God. A little leaven leavens the whole dump, sorry, the whole lump of dough. I should just point out that um, if it's got brackets around, because uh, it means that there's no word there in the Greek. So to get it to make sense in English, the translators insert that word to give it the same meaning in English that it has in the Greek. That's if you're wondering what the brackets are for. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever that is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished, and I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but what Paul's basically saying is if, if outward external circumcision meant something, then you wouldn't need the cross. If all you had to be was circumcised and go through a few rituals, then Jesus didn't need to go to the cross and you don't need to take up your own cross either. But what did Jesus say? If anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his own cross. You must crucify the old nature. You must die in order to live. Right? Paul saying here, so if what these guys are preaching, if all you need is a snip, then everything Jesus did, you'd be saying that that was meaningless. Well, that's a, that would be a blasphemy, right? That's why he says... It's a bit rude, right? You all know what circumcision is physically. 
So he's actually been a bit rude for Rambo. There at the end, he says, I wish that those troubling you would mutilate themselves. What he means is that they wouldn't just circumcise, be circumcised, that they might miss and chop something else off altogether. <laughs> so he's pretty angry with them. That's what the Greek means, right? So he's intense. Do, he's saying to the Galatians, you have the real thing. Do not let these people trouble you and lose what by the grace of God when he inclined himself toward you to give you this opportunity to be the bride. Do not let that go in order to please these men who are themselves very confused. So when he says here, we're on the last page now, page five, so he says, who hindered you from obeying the truth? So once again, Paul is in no way suggesting that grace in any way cancels the need for obedience. Not by any means. As we were just saying, agape, everywhere Jesus uses that word, it, it's a loaded word, it's a love that compels you to obey God and his word. Grace is not a license to do as you please. It's freedom from the power of sin and not freedom to do what you like. God is not at any point cancelling anything he already spoke because he doesn't change and he didn't speak it lightly. So the only thing that's gone is ritual. The law itself remains. Jesus makes that clear. The man of lawlessness is the one to be worried about, so you will find it in the church an increasing pressure to be indifferent to God's law. Can anyone think of examples we've already had in the last couple of years? What's something that's absolutely contrary to God's law that you even get churches preaching is okay now? Same-sex marriage, gay priests. So whatever your view on those people, there is no question that it's contrary to God's law, right? God's law remains. But more and more, just what Jesus warned, false teachers will come and like water dripping on a rock will just erode away the fear of God and, the, and agape, love that wants to obey, will be replaced with something fake. Lawlessness. And those people will not enter the kingdom. That's clear in the scripture, right? Have we got any gay priests in London? Lots. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we're not, you know, we're not here to worry about them. We're here to worry about ourselves and whoever else we might be able to snatch from the flames. Because those people are going to be there in multitudes. Nothing we can do will change what God has already said will happen. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying though, yeah, yeah. you know, because a lot of people get so hung up on it. Oh, it shouldn't be this and it shouldn't be that. Well, you know what? God said it's going to be, so don't be surprised when it is. Does it mean it's good? No. But does it mean it's inevitable? Yes. So our goal is to walk the straight line and bring as many others with us as you can by having the truth and being able to share it. Let's move on to the last biggie. So uh, in the second paragraph on page five, because the rest there we've sort of covered, so you can read that again at home. So verse nine from Galatians five, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you that the Lord, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. What does a little leaven leavens the whole lump mean? Who said that first? This is Paul writing to the church in Galatia, right? But are those original words? Did he make that up? A little leaven leavens the whole lump? Who said it first? Jesus, what did he say? Beware the yeast of the Pharisees, for a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So that's 
pretty archaic English, right? What is lemon? What would if I supermarket across the road, I can go and buy some lemon there after. What? Raised. Anything that raises. So it's to do with bread making or baking. So anything that causes something to puff up. So that could be yeast, that could be baking powder, whatever. So anything that causes something to become puffed up. Why does God use yeast as a symbol of something he hates? Why is becoming puffed up a problem for God? We already covered it earlier. What is it? Right, yeah. So anything that causes the dough to be puffed up is a picture of something that causes his people to become puffed up. A picture of pride, right? And he says, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. So something that causes pride, something that causes the people to be puffed up. <coughs> that the Pharisees are good at feeding the people. He says, beware that, because even the little bit of it can spread through the whole arm. So you have to be on guard against whatever it is, because if you are lazy and you just let a bit in, then before you know it, the whole, your whole doctrine will be infected. It just spreads. One thing leads to another. Before you know it, you are, you know, pick a cult. What is that thing? What is the yeast of the Pharisees? What is this leaven that actually it results in pride? So pride is the outcome of the leaven being there. Because once you're puffed up, it causes you to be puffed up. But being puffed up is the pride. But there's something that causes it. Think of our two friends on the cover. Remember the Pharisee was full of pride. What did the other guy have? Humility. And what was his humility based on? Truth. Truth. Right? What do you think the use of the Pharisees is? Lies. Right? False teaching. The use of the Pharisees is their teaching. Right? Go to Passover. Passover. And you have something that's a symbol of the body of Christ, right? And what's that? It's the matzah, right? The bread. But what does that bread have to be to qualify as bread for Passover? For Passover? It has to be unleavened, pierced and striped, right? But it must be unleavened. You, it must have no pride. Jesus comes, though he is God, he humbles himself to be just like a carpenter. He humbles himself and he doesn't even argue with Pilate, does he? He doesn't argue with Herod. He doesn't argue. He just goes like a lamb to the slaughter in obedience to his father. He is the unleavened bread. I am the bread of life. What kind of bread are you? Unleavened. Without sin. No pride or arrogance. The leaven of the Pharisees results in those people I've talked about in the church before who think that they are already co-ruling with Christ, who strut around like little gods with an ego that needs a separate trailer to carry it, you know? Because they are full of the yeast of the Pharisees' false teaching. Then instead of bringing them like the tax collector, humbled before God and the fear of God in order to meet God on God's terms to be saved, seeking to be forgiven, to be transformed, to be sanctified, to be made holy, to be dressed for the wedding, to be taken to the wedding as the bride, to then, and only then, co-reign with him. False teaching is the leaven. And a little false teaching soon results in a false denomination. So we are, Paul warns Timothy to study, to show yourself approved, to be careful about what he teaches. You know? Almost obsessive. That's why we study. 
And that's why we study together, because it's much harder to, to send a whole lot of people off on a tangent if all of them are seeking the truth and all of them are putting their mind to understanding the scripture and the spirit is with us to make the truth known to us, then our chances are great for success in being pretty much on the narrow way as far as a human might be. Does that mean we can then be proud and walk around like little roosters? On the contrary, it will have the opposite effect. Paul, at the end of his ministry, or close to the end of his ministry, what does he say of himself? I do the things I hate. I hate the things I do. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Was he imagining that in his great maturity of faith, he now had caused to strut around like a little peacock? By no means. But you look at all these guys on the stage strutting up and down in their shiny suits. You know? and causing others to imitate them. I hope their suits are made of asbestos they're going to need it. Right? He says here in um, Matthew 18, this is our last part, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, so in other words, the little ones, the Christians who are on the right way and then someone causes them to stumble with a false teaching or whatever. It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. They've all read that, right? So what I'm saying is, don't, well, the scripture already says, don't be a teacher unless you're called to it, right? Because teachers will be judged more harshly than anybody else. Why? Because what you say affects so many people, right? So don't hurry and volunteer to be a teacher unless you have that calling. But here it says, if anyone causes my little ones to be lost, it would be better if they just took a millstone, hung it around their neck and drowned themselves in the sea. So normally in church, when you read this scripture, the conclusion is you better to just kill yourself Right? Then be a false teacher. It's astonishing that none of these thousands of guys on TV have ever read that. But it actually has a specific meaning. I thought it was worth saying. What is a millstone? I think you have them in the Philippines, don't you? Like yeah, yeah. Like a grinding yeah. stone? Yeah. A millstone. Heavy. Yeah. And it can be from that round to like a big English mill where the, the oh, stone yes, might weigh, yeah. what would you think? Probably five or six tons maybe, the huge granite, maybe, you know, two or three metres across. They could be massive, right? Why a millstone? Why doesn't why doesn't Jesus say you should just stick a big heavy chain around your neck and drown yourself? Why is it a millstone? What does a millstone do? Grain. What? Grain. Grain. What is grain a symbol of in the scripture? It ends in bread. When it's grain, it is the harvest, right? That results in the bread. To refine, to get bread, can you just chuck grain in with an egg and a bit of milk and get bread? You'll get a pretty crunchy something, right? What do you have to do? You have to refine it, right? In the scripture, the grain is the raw word of God. But to make it digestible, it has to be made into bread. The teachers refine the understanding to deliver it in a digestible way. Does that make sense? The millstone is associated with the teachers because they are the millstone. If you're a bad millstone, you will not end up with edible bread. So if you are one of these people, Jesus is saying, you and the millstone that you are, you both need to be thrown in the sea, right, and drown, because 
you're not producing fine flour for bread, you're producing something that will be making your my horse sick. You know? That's the first half. Why the seam? Well, it's because the sea represents something in scripture and it's particularly in the book of Revelation. What does the sea represent, you know? Like evil. evil, yeah. So in 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 Hebrew understanding, the sea, like in the Revelation, the beast comes up out of the sea and steps up onto the dry land, onto the rock. Right? The sea is the world. Satan's domain. Dry land, solid ground, is Christ's domain. So the sea is a picture of the fallen world. So Jesus is saying, leave my lambs alone. You and the, mil and the useless millstone that you are, it's better that you go and be drowned in Satan's domain. And that's exactly what God does at the end. Second Thessalonians 2. He says, I'll cause, I'll send on them a strong delusion and cause them to believe it. He takes all of those people that have no love for the truth, especially the false teachers, and he literally drowns them in the sea. He gives them over to the world and the prince of the world. And there they will perish. Okay? So it still basically means, yeah, you're better to kill yourself than be a, bad, a false teacher. That simple meaning still stands, but at least now you know why Jesus chooses these particular words. So that's, we're probably about halfway through Galatians 5, so we'll, next week we'll try and finish the rest. But just a thought to go out on is our last one there, Luke 9. We're not going to study it, just have it ringing in your ears as we go. Luke 9, 23, then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it if someone, uh, is for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self, their soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Words to live by. So that's us for tonight and next week. There's nothing in the way next week, is there? No? So, so next week we'll meet again and we'll, we'll finish Galatians 5 and go from there, see where the Lord takes us from there. So uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you, we pray and ask, that you'd help us be, Lord, humble but not humiliated, that you would help us to have a love of the truth, that you would open our eyes, that you would give us the Holy Spirit to recall to our minds everything that you have said, never mind what the churches have said, never mind what the plethora of false teachers are blabbering on about, Lord. We only want to hear from our shepherd. We want to know what you have said your eternal world, a word that does not change. Fill us with that, Lord. Transform us, sanctify us, wash us clean. Prepare us and help us, Lord, be fruitful branches so that we wouldn't just be, Lord, living in the bubble, looking after ourselves, but that all of this in some way and somehow, Lord, in your grace, we might go with you and rescue with you. As many as can yet be rescued, that we can somehow be a part of that and help you in it, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And that's it. Good night. Good night. Shalom.